Hello, I'm Susan Denser from the Dartmouth class of 1977 and senior policy fellow at the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. I'm also former chair of the Dartmouth Board of Trustees, a longtime member of the Geisel Board of Advisors and a current member of the advisory board of Geisel's Center for Global Health Equity. I'm honored to be moderating today's conversation, celebrating women's well-being and leadership during Women's National Health Month and brought to you by Geisel's Women in Healthcare and Biomedical Sciences Alumni Affinity Group. Let me underscore that our topic today is in fact women's well-being and leadership. It is not going to be another topic very much in the news, which is recent honor code violations at Geisel Medical School. None of our panelists today are directly involved in that issue. Again, that's not our topic today. We will not entertain questions on it. Rather, we will focus on this topic, women's leadership and well-being. And to that end, we have a wonderful roster of speakers today to speak about that. They include, first of all, my Dartmouth 1977 classmate and friend, Joanne Conroy. She's a longtime physician and anesthesiologist who now serves as CEO and president of Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Also, we're delighted to be joined by Yolanda Nesbeth, who earned her PhD at Geisel in microbiology and immunology in 2010, and is now Director of Strategy and Operations and Lead Worldwide for Medical Oncology at Bristol-Myers Squibb. In that capacity, she coordinates critical cross-tumor and strategic initiatives to advance the cancer drug pipeline at B, uh, BMS and to drive excellence across the company's worldwide medical oncology franchise. And finally, we're very happy to be joined by Joyce Sackey, who's a member of the Dartmouth class of 1985, also a Geisel graduate in 1989. She's now associate provost and chief diversity officer at Tufts University's Health Sciences School and also Dean for Multicultural Affairs and Global Health at Tufts University School of Medicine. I'm also delighted to report that she's also a trustee elect of the Dartmouth Board of Trustees and will be officially joining the board and sworn in to that role in July. Before we get started, I wanna run through a few housekeeping items. First of all, we want this session to be as interactive as possible, and we're gonna do our very best to make it that way. We're gonna begin with conversation among the panelists, but we also want to take any questions that you may have during a robust Q&A period. So please submit any questions that you have through the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your webinar window. If you see a question that you're interested in and you like, please upvote it to ensure that it rises to the top of the list of questions. If you encounter any technical challenges today, please let us know that via the chat box and we'll do our best to address those. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to everybody who attended today's session. And last of all, you'll be receiving a survey at the end of today's program. Please do take a brief moment to provide your feedback to us to help us enhance future programming. Now to kick off today's discussion, I wanna start with a poll question for our audience members. So in which of the following categories do you place yourself? Are you a leader in your organization? Are you a leader in your field? Are you an aspiring leader in your organization or field? Are you a former leader? Are you something else or you don't quite know? So let's just take a moment and see how our audience responds to these uh, interesting and important polling, polling questions. We'll give it just a minute for everybody to vote. It's like waiting to watch the presidential election returns, isn't it? What's, what's the suspense only builds. Okay. 
well, it seems to be taking a bit of time to get this poll working. So why don't we move on in the interim uh, and we'll come back and see what the results say in a moment. Oh, here we go. All right, so we've got a good, good representation of leaders in the organization, about 40%. Uh, some leaders in the field, a lot of aspiring leaders, that's great to know, and a couple of former leaders and some others as well. So good, we've got a good diverse audience to think about this whole set of questions around women's well-being and leadership. So thank you for responding to that. All right, now moving on, what we want to do is talk with our panelists, uh, and I asked each of them to answer this question. If I made a movie, of your life as a leader, what would be the most important scene leading up to your role as a leader? What was in the backdrop of your career that got you to leadership? What's been most instrumental and influential in getting you into your current leadership role and why? So each of our panelists will take a few moments to answer that question now. And Joanne, I'm going to put you on the spot and turn to you first. All right. Thanks, Susan. Um, th and thank you for including me in this conversation tonight. So I would say the most important thing in my leadership is my uh, interest and um, kind of I embrace actually taking personal and professional risk. If I was going to put it in a movie, it would be like that person that's thinking about jumping from building to building, and they're doing a little bit of calculation, but they don't take very much time before they run and jump. And actually, that stood me in good stead. I would say that um, um, I've taken a lot of risks, and many of them have turned out well. Not all of them, certainly. I've got a few bumps and bruises and scars to um, to illustrate that not all chances actually turn out great, but um, many more have turned out well than not. And as you think about the ones that turned out well, were there any particular ingredients uh, that made those opportunities turn out well? So I think part of it is that probably a little naivete. Um, remember the scene in Private Benjamin where I think she ended up um, being volunteered for something, but it's not because she stepped forward, it's because everybody stepped back. And that's one of the leadership things I notice is there are a lot of people that don't actually step forward. In fact, I would say um, stepping forward and taking on a task without <clears throat> a lot of hand wringing is kind of a unique characteristic which distinguishes you from a lot of other people. And I had actually started that as back in the medical university when um, you know, we had a horrible financial situation in the department and I stepped forward and said, I'll fix it. And um, probably um, a bigger challenge than I thought it was gonna be with all the politics, but I learned a lot from that. And those situations that didn't turn out so well, any common denominators there? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so, um, sometimes not anticipating um, what could go wrong. It doesn't mean that it, you would not jump, but you were forewarned um, about either the politics or um, your own blind spots. I would say those two sometimes um, um, kind of hit you in the back of the knees when you're doing something from a leadership perspective, this really tough. I think it takes a lot of time and experience to understand the politics and their politics everywhere, um, but also your own blind spots, the things that are inherent to how you do business that could be a liability. I used to be incredibly trusting, not that I'm not incredibly trusting now, but I trust and I verify almost all the time when it's a really important decision. Uh, ex excellent advice for all of us to keep in mind. So Yolanda, I'm going to put that same question to you. So I'm out there, I'm a producer, I'm making a movie of your life as a leader. What are the seminal scenes that uh, we show maybe early in your life, maybe uh, somewhat later on that culminate in you becoming the leader you are today? 
you know, I am going to go with Joanne and actually uh, try to act, uh, go along with the movie scene. And I'd probably fit more into the romance type um, movie where there's a character not too refined <laughs> um, and then they turn out to be the perfect person after, right? Um, and I say that from the perspective of what I've learned over the years is that opportunities don't always come in the most nicely wrapped packages, right? Um, Sometimes you have to take initiative, crack the door open a little bit, and then um, over time push it as you develop and, and demonstrate your value. And I say that um, because from my trajectory, um, which started from, as you know, you asked about sort of even from the earliest. And so um, I can talk about from the initiation of my career straight out of <laughs> high school actually, um, I, I knew from then that I wanted to be in the drug development field. And so, you know, one of the, the first things, and it kind of sort of catapulted me to take on this approach for everything in the future was, um, I sought out an opportunity at a regional government facility, the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit, despite there not being any postings. And it was only for a few months, but having demonstrated value in that position, it sort of allowed me to actually get a full-time offer um, to, to, to work there during the duration of my undergraduate studies. Um, and this trend kind of followed suit so that, you know, after completing my PhD in immunology, I, um, I did healthcare consulting, but then having wanted to get back closer to that development space, um, I did transition back to uh, Soldaro Medical, but that was bred through a relationship or, you know, having been able to be recruited to that position was bred through having, um, you know, reached out years before, you know, ask, you know, uh, sharing my career aspirations and, um, you know, asking if there were any opportunities that, you know, mapped and aligned and would give me the experience that would allow me to drive um, a little bit further. Um, and so I did do a project. And so many years later, I was able to be recruited to join the team um, to be full time. And then later, um, about halfway through working there, um, you know, I did see an opportunity wherein um, there was a mutually beneficial opportunity to establish a site in the greater Washington DC area. Um, so I, I proposed that I would be the one to go and launch um, that opportunity, be the site head um, and, and, and uh, continue my growth and development through that. Um, you know, after that, I, I then transitioned to uh, Bristol Myers Squibb um, last year. But um, I think for me, it was really, you know, taking the initiative to identify opportunities that could bring out that, that leadership and really pushing forward and knowing that there's not always going to be essentially a position that maps exactly what you want, but really going in there and driving and developing that into, into um, a launching pad for, for growth. So that's why you use the analogy of... Uh... Yeah, the, the, you the meet, scruffy. You meet, you meet somebody who doesn't necessarily seem to be Mr. Right, but it turns out to be better than you thought. Correct. Right. Um, so I just wanted to double back. Did you say you wanted to be in drug development when you were in high school? Did I, I hear that right? From I could speak, probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. So you yeah. really had that innate drive. Uh, Probably. Yeah, I mean, I would say I was laser focused. Um, I, I did, you know, so my minor was French or my second major actually was French. So I still made sure that it was, you know, broad, but I was still pretty, I don't know, direct from early. So, And of course, this was back in Jamaica where you're from originally, correct? Correct. That's, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, phenomenal story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank so you. Joyce, to go to you. Uh, I make, I'm making that movie of your life as a leader. What's the seminal scene? First of all, thank you so much. Uh, I love this question and thank you for um, uh, allowing me to participate in this uh, discussion. I would say uh, the theme of my movie will have to be surprises, surprise charms, uh, because I feel like every step of the way my leadership um, opportunities have come as a surprise and then I've risen to the occasion. So I'm not necessarily the kind that would go uh, looking for leadership or sort of having a five-year plan towards a leadership position. But um, every single step of the way I've been surprised. So I would say one of the scenes I would hope you would have in there would be a scene from when I was a resident 
at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And the program director um, invited me for lunch and I was convinced that I had maybe um, had a near miss or done something to a patient. And this is why the program director wants to have lunch with me. And I nearly fell off my chair when she told me that the decision they had, uh, the Department of Medicine had decided, the program had decided that they would invite me to be chief resident. And I truly didn't see this coming. I, I actually had gone through residency um, struggling with our first child that my husband and I had who subsequently died. And I felt like I, I was doing all I could to just be a good resident and not kill patients. And so the notion that somebody actually saw in me something that was um, worth um, sort of highlighting as a chief resident really blew me away. And I remember coming home and telling my husband and saying, there's no way, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. And he's like, you can do this. And he's been my stonewall. Every time I come and I say, I'm so surprised they want me to do this. He goes, you can do it. <laughs> you know? So I, I, I decided to be uh, to accept to become a primary care chief resident. And that changed my trajectory because up until then, I was so focused on my loans, my student loans, that I wanted to basically go out and do practice and pay off those loans. But that year of being a chief resident and being responsible for really uh, orchestrating the teaching for the residency program, we have a we had then a pretty large residency program, uh, really gave me a taste of what it would be like to remain in academia. And so after my chief residency year, when um, the division chief then recruited me to join the general medicine, the division of general medicine and primary care. That seemed like a natural uh, thing to do. The other scene that I hope um, will be featured is how that same division chief who recruited me then approached me one day and said, we've decided to do this experiment where our practice is rather large. We have 130 residents and about 60 physicians practicing in this hospital-based practice. And what we've decided to do is to have four parts, four practices basically, and innovate in each of those four. And we would like to uh, invite you to be the suite director for one of them. And that again, blew me away. And what Tom um, uh, explained to me at the time was that he had watched me as a chief resident and saw that I had the administrative skills to be able to be a suite director. Um, and so I jumped in. It was a surprise where I jumped in and discovered that actually I love being uh, a medical director and, and being part of innovation and improving the, the practice and the flow of uh, caring for patients. And then I, I think that the thing that probably also uh, led me to this role that I'm, I have now at TAPS will be the scene where a, uh, a, a colleague of mine approached me and said, have you considered applying for this uh, position in the academic societies at Harvard Medical School? I was at Harvard at the time. And I hadn't even seen the job description. I hadn't even seen the posting. Uh, I was just buried in doing what I was doing at the time. And I had to then quickly find out what it meant to work in an academic uh, society for students. And instantly, um, once I applied and got selected, fell in love with working with medical students. And I'm convinced that it was that role that then led uh, Tufts to give me a call and ask me to apply for my dean position at Tufts. So I hope, I hope you've, you've gotten the sense that the theme here is really serendipity, but um, each time it's also been very exciting as, I, as I've made the turn to a new, a new chapter. So what I'm hearing from all three of you, I think is just a marvelous assemblage of both uh, attributes and uh, frankly attitudes toward life. Uh, from Joanne, sort of fearlessness, daring do, leaping, leaping from one tall building to the next, maybe a little naivete thrown in, Joanne, you said. Um, then Yolanda, sort of drive and focus, uh, as well as the ability to take something in hand that doesn't necessarily seem perfect on its face, but use it to your own advantage and grow I'll use it as an opportunity to grow. And then as you've just said, Joyce, that combination of surprise and serendipity, the twists and turns in the road, uh, that as you go around one turn, a new vista opens up and you uh, take advantage of it and grow also. 
through it. So just a, a terrific set of uh, descriptions, diff different shades of, uh, of what evolves in one's life uh, to get you into leadership roles. Um, the, let's talk about uh, what you've learned over the years too, reflecting back. And obviously already we've started to talk a bit about that. Uh, Joanne, you, you talked about lessons learned from situations that worked out well, situations that did not, uh, how to be aware potentially of your own blind spots. But I'd love you each to tell me an anecdote of something uh, that, you learn, that you learn possibly the hard way uh, along the way that you think is part and parcel of being a leader, uh, maybe not the most pleasant part always of being a leader, but a very important part of being a leader. And let's reverse order on this one. And Joyce, I'll start with you this time. Thank you. So I would, I would actually pick on one of the themes that I, I had shared. Um, so one of the things that um, was quite an adjustment for me was being one of the primary care physicians in my division and feeling like I was I was part of the team to suddenly being tagged at, as a medical director was, was that I suddenly realized that taking that responsibility meant that people would either praise you when things go well or blame you for institutional decisions that uh, you may or may not have um, uh, supported. So we had some fits and starts. It, uh, it felt to me like a, a really a steep learning curve of how to, behind the scenes, advocate for things that you know your colleagues will not like, <laughs> such as suddenly changing the, uh, the uh, platform that people were using for um, the electronic medical records, for instance, and, and, and the complaints that you would get. But then once you've advocated behind closed doors, and you emerge and people are complaining to really make sure that you are absolutely representing the leadership. And that was a tough thing because I, I was used to sort of being the, the person that is advocating and saying, wait a minute, leadership, you got to change. But then learning to then straddle the two worlds of, of uh, not throwing people under the bus, but doing that quiet advocacy behind the scenes, but also at the, at the end of the day, holding up the leadership decision that is made, um, whether it's a correct decision or not, was I, I think probably the unpleasant initially, but most important learn, lesson that I had to learn. Uh, it's a different world when the shoe is on another foot and you're the one making the decisions uh, that often are not necessarily the most popular decisions, clearly. Great, well, great story. And I guess Yolanda, let's go to you next. Uh, sure comparable story in your in your past uh, and I would say you know early one challenging or one um, challenging situation that I learned through was early when I drove a team that was actually highly successful um, they actually surpassed um, the target um, under budget on time and in my review I was actually significantly dinged. And the reason behind this was at the end of this whole project, despite executing on target, the team dynamics were more than suboptimal um, and largely due to some personal uh, personality issues. And I think, you know, that was really, uh, um, and kind of, you know, similar to one of the things that Joyce had mentioned, it was, it was very eye-opening from the perspective of you know, executing is critical, but people management is one of the, the, the biggest components of being a leader, right? And so it's been one of the, and, and I naturally tend to have good relationships on a one-on-one -on -one basis with individuals, is that team dynamic that was really, really struggling. And so, um, you know, that's been something that I've had to work towards understanding more closely individual motivations, ensuring that individuals as well as the team um, are succeeding. And um, yeah, just generally, you know, focusing a lot more on the people management component and making sure that the comprehensive message is, is um, package is, is delivered. Uh, the people management piece is just so critical, right? And uh, particularly in the kinds of positions you all are in where 
it requires technical expertise to get as far as you can to be a physician or uh, be in a drug development. But then it requires this people component to leap over that and take on the role of, uh, of, of leadership. Uh, really, really a great, uh, great uh, illustration of what, what it takes. Thank you, Yolanda. Well, Joanne, your turn about the hard lessons learned. So as a young leader at the Medical University of South Carolina, I either was interim chair or had been recently appointed chair, you know, we, I made a decision that we really had to revise our practice plan. It's how money is distributed among the department. It really wasn't equitable at all. The senior uh, leaders were taking the vast majority of the revenue for their personal salaries. And I thought the young, um, young faculty probably were paid far less than they should be paid. So we had to kind of rebalance the practice plan. I worked on it like for two or three weeks. It's probably, I researched everything. I ran all the calculations. And when I presented it to the senior members of the department, oh my God. I mean, the room kind of erupted. And, you know, one person was so angry. He was yelling at me. I could feel his spit on my face. And you just have to kind of not take it personally. Um, but, you know, I left that room feeling like I'd been beaten with a two by four across my back. And, you know, just from a combination of tension and just the anger in the room. So I learned a couple of things from that. Number one, when you um, make some changes that affect people's compensation, it's their livelihood. Don't underestimate the importance of that. Um, because other people have a lot of demands on their salary and compensation that, you know, I didn't have any kids. I, I didn't necessarily appreciate all of them, number one. Number two, it's being right is not enough. It's making sure that everybody's got their fingerprints on the product, which really allows you to be successful. And so I went back and I said, okay, let's start again. And had a couple subgroups that looked, that worked on different aspects of it. And you know, they came back and we developed a plan. It was a little bit different. It wasn't as equitable as I liked, but hey, um, it moved us forward and gave a little bit more equity to the younger faculty who I felt we were at risk of losing if we didn't pay them appropriately. And, um, and the senior members gave. They compromised in order to get us to a better place. That was a really important lesson. And from then on, I said, you know, you don't actually have to have all the right ideas. You just have to be able to get other people to surface their ideas and, um, you know, be part of the, the product. And that's the most important way of getting stuff done. Well said. It's, uh, it really is team, right? It's leadership of a team. Well, let's start to take some of the questions that have come in from the audience and we'll weave those into uh, other questions that I want to pose to you. One of members of our audience has asked, how do you manage up with other leaders you are working with when you're trying to drive change? Uh, Yolanda, let's put that question to you for starters. Yeah, so I think, you know, kind of similar to a point that Joanne made, um, initiating from the concept of, you know, making sure that you're well prepared for the argument. But one of the things that I've learned, especially most recently, is the socialization aspect, ensuring that when you are going to bring a, a um, some sort of change forward, um, socializing with the uh, multiple stakeholders to get that buy-in first um, and, and to gather that sort of feedback has been one of the things that has been, I guess, most recently over the past year, I've seen a lot of situations in which, um, you know, we've had to learn to adapt to ensure that there's been a significant amount of socialization, gaining that buy-in, ensuring that, you know, feedback is appropriately incorporated before really trying to, to convince, you know, you've had to ensure that you've gone through all the different scenarios in evaluating, is this the right step forward and hearing multiple voices? Because part of the um, issues, especially in managing upwards, is, is 
having people felt like they are incorporated included in the process um, and that their voice was a part or critical component in ensuring that um, you know things will actually go places as opposed to um, just trying to drive um, an initiative without getting that buy-in. So, so managing up in this context means uh, basically touching base regularly with the people around you and theoretically above you, keeping them brought in all, at all times on what you're doing. Is, that's yeah, so I guess, strategy. yeah, and I guess I was thinking more of a scenario in which we were trying to drive a, a, a change that involved the cross-functional stakeholders. Um, so leadership, not just my direct leadership, but leadership um, across the organization, in which case, um, I guess, the best way that I have seen that works really well is, you know, developing that plan and then going, hey, what do you think about that, essentially, but in a formal uh, context, gathering that feedback, gathering that buy in from that perspective, so that when things start to be rolled out, um, having had the incorporation of all of that feedback and having had um, the expectation that they're not seeing it for the first time in this global setting. Um, um, basically helps in my perspective in terms of getting um, that management piece. Joanne, do you, what would you add to that discussion on managing up? Uh, and including with one's board. I'm, yeah, right? so um, <clears throat> a couple things I've, I've learned to, number one, make sure that um, your conversation is purposeful and respectful. Um, I have been in enough political situations that I understand that sometimes people are threatened when um, people are um, kind of trying to move ideas through an organization that maybe aren't theirs. And often they're people that are come from kind of traditional roles. I would say the second thing is make sure that um, you know, you keep people at a strategy level where they need to be at a strategy level. So for our board, um, I'm very respectful of their time, their volunteers, they give a lot of time to us, but I wanna keep them um, being purposeful around strategy and not encouraging them to get into management. There are some gender dynamics here too that come into play. Um, often if you ask advice from a senior, um, person who's a man and he gives you advice, he actually expects you to take that advice. So you have to say, I'm gathering advice from many people. Because if you just ask him his advice, he's going to say, why didn't you take my advice? And so you have to really make sure that people actually stay in the strategic advice giving realm, rather than managing the problem for you. Because there are a lot of a lot of people that that's, that's their go-to strategy. So I would say that's a danger of trying to manage up to make sure that they don't start actually dipping down into the things you're trying to accomplish. It's not good for anybody. Great. Uh, so Joyce, let's give you an opportunity to take a whack at that, the managing up question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I feel like a lot of leaders learn on the on the job, so to speak, about this um, I have something that I call the meeting before the meeting. And so if I'm about to unveil an initiative or make an ask or make a, of course I work at a university and I, I have two, two uh, bosses. One is the Dean of the medical school and the other is the provost of the university. And so before I unveil something, I make sure that I have a meeting one-on-one -on -one with my, my leader, my boss, to make sure that they understand my rationale for why I wanna make that pitch or make that change or intervention and make sure that they um, are ready then to sort of go to bat. For me, uh, when we go into the larger meeting, I never want to surprise a university leader or surprise a medical school leader. Um, part of that managing up also means that sometimes you have to figure out who's the better, who's the better messenger. And so there've been times when even though the idea may have originated from me, I have urged my boss to say, I think this is gonna go over well if you say it. And, and then I literally give them talking points and have them then deliver the message because I feel like that's right. And I think that's a hard thing to do because I think as, as a woman and especially as a woman of color, 
I've had my share of ideas being sort of essentially taken from me and ascribed to somebody else. And so you would think that it that that experience will lead me to want to constantly be the one who actually publicly launches something. But I've learned that in fact, if you have that meeting for the meeting and you set aside your ego and you actually encourage the person and say, you know, it's okay, you don't have to even give me the credit for it. This is something that we want to do as an institution. What you have is you have an ally for life. Great. Well, these uh, comments that you all have just made lead us very nicely into our next question, which is really let's talk about being a woman leader and being women leaders. And what would you say are the advantages and disadvantages that you've encountered in being women leaders? And that's a question that's come in from uh, Karen Hine. What would you say if we start, let's, let's start on the upside here, advantages, Joanne, you, you talked about a disadvantage just a moment ago, which is that uh, sometimes the men don't always get where you're coming from, but what's an advantage? I would say that, um, you know, women are a little bit more skilled in kind of relationship building um, from a almost kind of a cross kind of institutional perspective. And um, we've taken a few lessons from the playbook of men um, who did kind of have a club and there were secret rules in the club. And I think women have actually learned to leverage their network as well and um, help each other out. Um, I would say it's pretty easy for a woman to ask another woman to amplify her voice in a meeting and they talk about it ahead of time. So they make sure that somebody doesn't actually grab credit for an idea. And that happened in the Obama White House. They wrote about it. And a lot of the women staffers there brought it to his attention and said um, that it was going on. There was a little bit of, of idea stealing, but they actually made a concerted effort to amplify each of this voice. And that's something that women have figured out how to do effectively. And I think a lot of that comes from the easy networking that women have. And um, it's a it's a little bit of a different process, but men do have a network as well. But it's a little bit more testosterone driven around the board table, I think. Um, and women's roles and um, interactions are a lot more collaborative. Great. So we'll stay on advantages. Uh, Yolanda? Yeah, I, I would also add that there's generally a little more tendency towards diplomacy and delivery and also um, empathy that helps with that people management component, um, which for better or worse, but I think that in terms of better understanding um, conflicting priorities or external uh, priorities in terms of the home environment or whatever else may be um, bleeding into the ability to effectively execute, I think that there's another value in better understanding and, and using that to drive how you can assist the team and the people management. And Joyce, your sense of the advantages of being a woman leader. Well, I, I have to say that um, I would say listening skills, obviously this is not a gendered uh, comment, but I, in general, I find that women tend to come by these skills of doing more listening than talking a little more easily. And closely linked to listening actively is collaboration. So part of my personal style, for instance, is to hear from different perspectives, like Joanne mentioned earlier, really gather all the thoughts, knowing that you're not the only uh, source of all the good ideas in the room. And I, I, I find that very, a uh, natural thing to do before I make a decision rather than um, just sort of jump quickly into the decision. It's actually saved me quite a bit where I've learned perspectives that I otherwise would not have considered. So I, I like to think that that is coming from the point of being a woman, but also being a mother where I had to learn to listen deeply to my, my kids, especially when they got to teenage years and if you didn't listen, then forget it. They're not going to listen to you. <laughs> Well, don't worry, they'll come back five years from now and be amazed how much you learned in the interview in five years, right? 
So let's do a quick round on the disadvantages of uh, being a woman leader. Uh, we don't have to dwell on these, but we know they exist. Uh, and again, in backwards order, Joyce. I would say um, one of, I, I don't know if this is a disadvantage or not, but I think as a result of the nurturing aspect that I bring to my leadership, Unfortunately, sometimes there's issues with boundary where people would tell me far more than they ought to tell their boss. Uh, and I, I just watch and see that our male colleagues do not get that kind of detailed, you know, what I'm struggling with at home, health issues, family dynamic issues, kids uh, troubles, um, trouble with raising um, parents. I've heard all of this. And it makes it a little bit more burdensome, quite frankly. I had a particular situation where there was um, a, an employee who was underperforming, but they had also shared so much with me about their personal life that it was very difficult for me to sort of hold them accountable and be firm about what my expectations are because it, 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 you were worried that you'd be sort of seen as not being empathetic. So I, I would say, Easily, that would be one. When I compare those with my husband, he does not get the same level of people putting, uh, telling them about their personal issues. And uh, Yolanda, a, a disadvantage? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will say something else, but you know, adding on to what Joy said, and in addition to being, to, to being the recipient of the unloading, um, I think that many, women themselves often don't unload enough in terms of, you know, pushing back or, you know, giving that when it comes in the broader setting in the workplace. Um, but I think confidence, you know, there is, a, I, I see so many times this, and even to me, I'll have lack of confidence in, or I'll need to over prepare in order to deliver on certain things. And I see it in so many females in the workplace in terms of a lack of confidence, lack of confidence to raise a, a, a topic or an issue in a big forum. Um, you know, so the voice is, is, is missed, right? There's, if you don't elevate your voice, you don't get heard at all. Um, and so that whole piece of lack of confidence. And then on the flip side, when you do assert yourself, there is a perception of aggression. And so it's that having to navigate a finer balance than, um, you know, male peers often. Right. And Joanne, a, a disadvantage. Of so I went to medical school in South Carolina, started in 1979, and less than 10% of our class were women. I mean, I have some stories that could just make your toes curl, but I know when I was actually, I mean, the, just the level of gender inappropriateness was amazing. Um, when I was interviewing a, a Southern transplant surgeon said, honey, you're so good looking. Why do you want to go to medical school? Why don't you just get married and have some babies? And believe me, I, <laughs> and you, you think after, you know, 10 or 15 years that would go away, but I have been asked um, many inappropriate questions at interviews and you just kind of have to know how to just deftly deflect them um, and um, just continue to actually talk about the reason why you're interested in that role or um, you know I, I think we still have a lot of just like we have racism and gender discrimination that sometimes we're kind of blind to it uh, because it's become part of the fabric of our organization. Um, but I'd still have women come up to me, even here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock with examples of micro inequities. They, they're not illegal, but they do exist in the environment. And what you have to do is just surface them and talk about them and eliminate them. But um, we still have a lot of work to do. Indeed we do. Well, the topic of mentorship is a popular one in the Q&A box. So let's turn to that. And on both sides of it, uh, how you have been mentored by others, what the value of mentorship has been in your own life, and then how you have in turn mentored other women uh, and other, other, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be women, other younger people rising through the ranks. And 
let's uh, we're we're getting we've just got about ten minutes left, so let's keep our answers for uh, this uh, ro co combination of robust but also crisp, if we could. And Yolanda, let's start with you on that. So just examples of how we have or benefits of each of the relationships. And pick, feel free to pick one. If, uh, if you'd like to talk more about being mentored or mentoring, feel free to just pick one side of that or the other. Yeah, so I think I'll just, you know, quickly as a, for, t for time reasons, focus on, you know, being a mentor and what I have actually learned or benefited from that perspective. And I think um, there are a few components, including... Um, you know, one is learning. I, I tend to have a little bit more of a closed nature in terms of the things that I would share just in a broader setting. And I think one of the things that um, I've learned through mentorship um, uh, situations is to build more vulnerable and build trust in that way, which is also very helpful in, in, in larger team dynamics and for future growth. Um, I think that, you know, the few other things that I have um, seen as good benefits from, um, from providing mentorship, um, also helping in that confidence building and understanding that there is a lot of value that you have gained over the, the years of, of doing whatever you're doing um, and, and really, you know, learning to not shortchange yourself, but to really um, consider yourself as a voice of, of, of wisdom. And I think, you know, one of the things that is um, also beneficial, that's, you know, a source of a secondary benefit has also been, you know, it's a good way to maintain relationships and networking in terms of not just with whomever you are providing support for, but I think in most of the scenarios I've been in, I've often had to make connections and, 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 um, and, and link people to other um, situations. And it's usually a great opportunity to reach out to the person that I'm trying to make a connection with and maintain that rapport. And I think that that is one of the things that I think is really critical in, you know, just managing our careers over time is, you know, maintaining some of these relationships with critical people. That, that's great. And Joyce, again, feel free to talk about being mentored or being a mentor. What, what did you, what have you learned through that experience? Well, I have to say the theme of what I've learned over the years, especially as a woman of color, is to lift as I climb. So whether it's when I was a resident or an attending or uh, administrative leader, is, is to really, even as I seek mentorship, that I also offer those mentorship for those who are coming behind me. It's so critically important. And I, I would say that one lesson that I always share with students and um, in my uh, junior faculty is don't think of a single mentor who will fulfill all your needs, but think rather of a personal board of advisors. So, or personal board of directors, as I sometimes say, that if corporations have board of directorships, why shouldn't you deserve one with your complicated um, career journey? And I learned it a hard way when I tried to have a, a male mentor fulfill all the needs that I had uh, in a mentor and discovered that uh, there was really no appreciation for the balance that I was having to strike between being a mother and being a physician and being a, a, an educator. And so biggest lesson, personal board of directors, I have one. And that means that I have lots of women on that board. I have some men, but mostly I have lots of women on that board. And that allows me, because they are in different aspects of my life, allows me to really fulfill all the areas that I need, I need mentorship, advice, and sponsorship. Well, I bet a lot of people are jockeying to be on your well, board of advisors, uh, Joyce, <laughs> for sure. Uh, okay, Joanne, uh, again, pick one, mentoring or being mentored. What have you learned? So I never really had any mentoring. I'm kind of a self-made product. Um, but one thing I was, was a student of leadership. So when I would see a good leader, I would um, observe what I thought made them good. And when I saw bad leaders, and I actually had a lot of bad examples, um, you could always learn something from them, decide why they probably weren't an effective leader, and make sure that you did not do that as a leader. And sometimes my, the difficult people that I worked with were the best opportunity to learn what not to do. And um, it's really being a student of leadership. And I still am a student of leadership. 
they probably have 200 leadership books at home. And, you know, I just find it fascinating because you're never too um, experienced to learn how to lead better. Uh, so true. So true. Well, as we have uh, alluded to throughout this conversation, there are a lot of benefits to being a leader, a lot of advantages. Uh, I think coming through all of you is a sense of the confidence that all of you exude. So we know leadership can do good things for your self-esteem. It can also be difficult, and it can be difficult, particularly in the context of work-life balance. And almost all of you have alluded to some real uh, difficult times along the way. Uh, Joyce, you talked about losing a child. Joanne, we know your husband Doug died not long ago. Uh, how, how have you coped through these enormous life-changing stresses and yet maintained your ability to function as leaders? Joanne, let's start with you on that. Sure. So um, my husband, um, DJ Johnson, died on um, April 26, a year ago. And it's interesting, you know, it was kind of in the middle of like the COVID mania. And I was like, you know, he had cholangiocarcinoma and from diagnosis to death was less than five months. It was, it was right in the middle of the peak of the pandemic. A couple of things that I think sustained me, number one, I'm a silver lining person. COVID actually allowed me to spend every single evening with him. And if I had all these national commitments and I was on the road, I would have been torn because sometimes you don't know when your expiration date is over. You know, you just don't always know the course of your life and when it will end. And um, I actually found that an amazing silver lining. And I, I could be with him um, when he needed me most. And, um, you know, I, I find great kind of solace in that. You know, I say the, the most amazing thing we can do as physicians is keep people at the end of their life a gentle landing, especially the people we love. And that allowed me to do that. And so I think that life, I mean, it's not a great thing to go through, but I, I think we gave him a gentle landing and that, you know, helps me sleep well at night. So powerful. Yolanda, balancing life stresses and, uh, and sorrows along the way amid leadership. In your experience, what, is, what has happened? You know, um, I'm really sorry to hear Joanne and Joyce, and it's it's surprising. You know, we all, uh, so many people have so much uh, unfortunate situations. I mean, I, I lost my father tragically in the middle of uh, trying to develop. And, and um, Joanne, I, I, I do recall having... Um, a similar experience wherein, you know, he went through cancer before um, he passed and I was able to dedicate a lot of time in those days. And, and that was the same thing where my perspective was, you know, I was really grateful for the opportunity to share. Um, I think moving forward and having had that experience early, you know, there are, um, you know, recollections that it's, um, work is not all there is to life. <laughs> Um, and I struggled with that for a very long time and I've had to and I continue to struggle with um, trying to find ways I think in addition to you know working and figuring out ways one of the things I've had to learn is both to delegate and to say no in my personal and professional life um, but in addition to that I think especially so you know I, I as a as a as a as a female who uh, did not have a family until much later in life. I still don't have children. Um, one of the things that I feel was often um, a, a struggle was um, there was an expectation that because I didn't have these uh, home priorities, I could take on the slack, not just at work, but also for other people's personal lives. You know, well, you don't have kids. Can you come watch my kids while we do X, Y, Z? You don't, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, there's a guilt factor in addition to a guilt factor when I wasn't taking time to do something for someone else, but just taking time for myself. Um, so learning to realize that, you know, that is critical and to eliminate the psychic thorn of, of thinking all the time when you're on your break that, um, you know, 
oh my gosh, there's so much work to do. I think it's really having had the experiences of loving and lust and losing. Um, I think it's really uh, a grounding experience to, to, you know, remind yourself that, you know, each day is golden and, and we really need to ensure that, you know, work is not the only thing that brings, you know, unless work gives you an, you know, a, a tremendous amount of pleasure, you know, it isn't the only thing that is there to our existence. Well, Joyce, we're going to give you the last word on this, uh, given given your tragic experience. Well, thank you. And I, I, I also am a, a, a silver lining person, a positive person. And I feel like um, although it was it was really painful to lose a child um, and, and to do so uh, in the very early stages of our marriage and and happening in the midst of a residency program. It, it actually, I gained so much from that experience. The first first gain was that my husband and I, um, our relationship aged like five years. <laughs> you know, it's nothing like having having a child who's ill and then losing that child. It really brought us really close together. The other is that we ended up having two healthy and beautiful children. Our son is now 28 and is a software engineer in LA. And uh, our daughter is uh, 25 and is an editor in New York City with a magazine. And I think something about having lost the first child meant that we became absolutely fierce parents for the next two that we had. And I'm grateful for that because I feel like I, I, it was not, I would not compromise taking time away from the kids more than I needed to. And that included my international health work. I remember, um, really suggesting that we needed to wait till the kids were out of school so that they will come with us um, to, to Ghana to do this HIV AIDS uh, conference. And by, by insisting on that, many other physicians on our team said, you know, I'm gonna bring my kids as well. And ended up really having a, a profound impact on our children as a result of that. And I'm, I'm grateful that it laid the groundwork for the kind of closeness that, that I now share with my adult children. And the final lesson I learned was more in the professional realm. I had preeclampsia during my pregnancy and was induced and that's what led to uh, the birth of my first son and, and ended up having complications and died. And that made me um, aware of the disparate uh, maternal morbidity and mortality that affects black women in this country. And it doesn't matter what, what class uh, your um, level of education and I've incorporated that into my work. So even though I'm a primary care physician, I also was very much drawn to women's health as, part, as an internist. And, and actually the joke in my practice for years was that working with Dr. Saki feels like you're working in OBGYN uh, uh, practice. But I, I, I became very acutely aware of making sure that I was caring for my female patients in particular and making sure that uh, their well-being was um, was priority, especially around um, around the time of childbearing. And I've continued to be an advocate for um, uh, maternal um, uh, health uh, throughout. Well, what a phenomenal conversation we have had over the past hour, uh, starting with those uh, seminal. Uh, movie scenes of all of your lives, uh, what shaped you as leaders. Uh, we talked about how best to go about managing up uh, and influencing other colleagues, including more senior colleagues. We've talked about the advantages and the disadvantages of being a woman leader. Uh, we talked about mentorship, both being a mentor and mentoring. And then we just ended with this amazing discussion about balancing work and real life. And each of you have told in a, such a powerful way, uh, stories of uh, personal uh, love and loss and how you have grown through those experiences and actually brought them to bear on your work and on your leadership roles. So I just, I just cannot think of a better conversation to have had on this topic in, uh, in, in National Women's Health Month. I wanna thank each of you, uh, Yolanda, Joyce, and Joanne for sharing with us your expertise, your insights, uh, your really intimate thoughts today. And thanks also to all of you in the audience for engaging with us in this conversation, celebrating 
Women's Wellbeing and Leadership during Women's National Health Month, and to the Women in Healthcare and Biomedical Sciences Alumni Affinity Group also for hosting this program. Please do not forget to complete the two-minute survey that you'll be receiving at the end of the program today. Your feedback really does help us inform future programming. Have a wonderful rest of the day wherever you are. Be well. Thank you very much.